Tom Quee presents The Royal Ramble, an episode-by-episode -episode celebration of the classic British sitcom The Royal Family. To get in touch with the show, email us at theroyalramblepod at gmail.com. Hello everyone, it's Tom Quee here and welcome to the first ever episode of The Royal Ramble. This is going to be a podcast hosted primarily by myself, maybe a few guests in the future, which is setting out to explore, dissect and celebrate every episode of the iconic British sitcom The Royal Family, which ran on the BBC for three series between 1998 to 2000 and then continued in the form of a few specials from 06 to 2012. Quick bit of background on myself, uh, you know, I'm not a TV academic or anything like that, I'm just a fan really. This isn't my first podcast however, I actually do quite a few, I'm kind of addicted to the format, I do one on battle rap called Battle Rap Resume, I have gone through uh, Metallica's back catalogue in alphabetical order, that's called Alpha Metallica, I also host a competitive wordplay game show podcast called Pun It. But that, you know, that's enough of the hawking there. I've never actually done one on a TV show before either. And as so many of my other favourite shows like, you know, The Wire, Sopranos, Simpsons, 30 Rock, The UK Office, I mean, as so many of those have so many podcasts dedicated to them already, I thought it'd be interesting to explore something that I would absolutely put as an equal to any of those aforementioned, that being the royal family. I mean, I've loved the show for a good while, I'm 28 for a point of reference, I was 6 when the show debuted, and I do have hazy memories of watching the second Christmas special, the one with Emma's parents, Roger and Valerie, Roger, of course the great John Henshaw, who would go on to play the landlord Ken in another uh, Craig Cash masterpiece, Early Doors, you know, I have memories of seeing that yeah i remember especially seeing jim getting sky digital at the end and oh god how, how late 90s is that sky digital and then for me you know as i got older in my early teens i would watch with you know my family with my dad and uh, my aunt as well uh, i think they used to play royal family back on uk tv gold regularly in the evenings and there's another turn of the century relic uk tv gold and i yeah, you know, I always thought the show was something special, really. And then, you know, as I got older, I didn't check out the show for a good while. Uh, I got into a lot of stuff, though, that shared that royal family DNA that I'd sort of been exposed to initially through the show. That The idea of the boxed-in narrative, you know, stories that take place in one location and value character and dialogue and inner world building over bombast. So stuff like 12 Angry Men, you know, My Dinner with Andre, the Before Sunset trilogy, Clerks even, to a certain extent. And it was only in the last couple of years when I was revisiting the show on Netflix with my recently ex-girlfriend, you know, I'll, I'll be okay. It was a spark for doing this. I mean, it would be our staple dinner viewing. She had never actually seen the show before, and, you know, we went for it once, and then I showed her early doors, and then we just kept going back to the Royal Family. It would be something that we would almost do our own little commentaries on, and something we would quote to each other, because, I mean, you know, if you listen to this, I don't need to tell you this, that the writing is just astonishing. Uh, the performances are, are pitch perfect. It's really funny, too, of course, to boot. But I don't really want to keep flinging superlatives at it. I'm going to be doing that throughout the episode. So how are these episodes going to work? Well, the shape of this show, The Royal Ramble, is still very much up in the air. But this is going to be an episode-by-episode episode type deal. So I'm going to be going from the pilot all the way up to the final episode, which was the 2012 Christmas special, Barbara's Old Ring. I, you know, I also want to do bonus episodes, uh, exploring the prehistory of the show, how it all came together, how Craig and Caroline met, all that sort of stuff. Uh, also profiles on the cast and crew. I mean, I would love to get some of the cast and crew on, actually. And, um, you know, hopefully that will happen. At the time of me recording this, I haven't really put the, uh, the feelers out, but having done, you know, my shows that I mentioned before, like on Metallica, like, big people are often just willing to talk if you, you know, reach out and tell them how much you love them, so hopefully that will happen. I mean, there will be spoilers as well, but, I mean, come on, there's not much to spoil to begin with. Um, the show is also more than two decades old, and this isn't The Sopranos, although Michael Imperioli, aka Christopher, 
from The Sopranos, uh, did recently say on his excellent Sopranos podcast, Talking Sopranos, which he does with uh, Steve Schripper, aka Bobby Bacala, that he was a giant fan of the Royal Family, which is so cool. And I also saw that Bob Odenkirk, aka Saul Goodman from Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, saying similar things, which, you know, is, is testament to the genius of this program, that uh, such titans of the industry are fans like the rest of us. You know, this isn't going to be a review per se, nor a commentary. It's, um, you know, it's a ramble it's a royal ramble and one of the things that i love so much about the royal family too is that it's a show stuffed to the gills with details both real in terms of uh, the references and the tv they watch the adverts the films the culture uh, that's mentioned and also imagine details in the form of the dense world building with the characters that we never meet and the progression of dave's farmyard and the like and you know i want to chronicle and chart those things as we work our way through you know ruminating on them and the characters and the plots and the themes and anything else that catches my fancy this show is so genius so well observed so wonderfully put together that uh, you know i think it deserves it and just before we dig into the analysis of course you can email the show the royal ramble pod at gmail.com i would love to hear your theories your reviews your impressions of the episodes you know i'm hoping as we go through we'll build up some sort of dialogue with listeners and you know i'll, I'll read out your interpretations your favorite moments or quotes or whatever and you know i'll do the same through the twitter as well which is at royal ramble pod i'll put all the links down below below uh leave us a review on itunes subscribe all that good sort of stuff but uh yeah let's get into it all right let's get into it and of course before we get into the episode itself we have to speak about the terrific title sequence which tellingly opens with the tv being switched on and us viewing everything through its blue slightly static fuzzed prism jim has actually got up off his ass and turned it on which i think is the only time in the show we actually see this happen it's a great introduction. Half the World Away by Oasis is playing, which we'll get to in a moment. And, you know, we fade in on the family on a typical evening in a variety of pairings. First, it's Jim on his throne, and then Barbara sitting down with a cuppa, and Jim scratching his crotch as he does. Then Barbara and Denise are alone interrogating a magazine with Siggy's. The backdrop behind is of an ironing board and washing that's never put away. After this comes a nice shot of Anthony, Ralph Little, creasing and Jim laughing along with him. And Ralph is like really barreling up here. I don't think I've ever laughed that hard in my life. And you certainly don't see him like that in the show. And from here, we cut into Doe-Eyed Dave, Craig Cash off in the corner and Denise sitting beside him, dredging his arm over a Jim, shooting a quick glance of disregard. And finally, the full family is formed, as it were, all assembled, all staring straight into the tube and straight into us with Dave's shirt oddly a mossy green amidst all the shallow blues for some reason. Uh, Jim turns over the channel, it cuts to black, and then we get the, the title itself, the esteemed font that the show uses, revealing the royal family. And obviously it is a misspelling, R-O-Y-L-E, and which with that pun, that's kind of the first indication that this is an arch knowing kind of ironic but loving look at the family one that is you know really tenderly presented of course and, and steeped in the experiences of the writers and, and, and familiar you know to, to anyone who watches it. i'm sure we see so much of ourselves in so many of the characters and situations and uh, the way they operate but you know what a show also that is entirely self-aware in its depiction with dramatic irony and nods to the audiences part and parcel of the whole presentation and in many ways this title sequence the scene shown here are similar similar to traditional sitcoms with the displays of the characters and you know the actors names but then again there's a dullness to the color you know we're at odd far off angles to the clan and they're slovenly and unengaged for the most part and this offbeat sense of despondency and abstraction is compounded through the theme song which is half the world away by oasis amazing song this song was um recorded at the congress house studio in austin texas uh, in usa in october 1994 it was the b-side to whatever which was a single that was kind of released as a um a, a stop gap 
between Definitely Maybe and What's a Story Morning Glory. Uh, it was released on the 18th of December 1994 and, and whatever reached number three in the charts. And obviously Oasis are from that same lineage of bands like um, you know, the Smiths and the Jam and, and the Beatles that really value the B-side. And um, this is an amazing song. During actual Q&A session at Salford Lads Club in October 2019, uh, Noel Gallagher revealed that the song was the favourite B-side he'd ever written for the band. And he was also on Matt Morgan's Funny How podcast. Matt Morgan being Russell Brand's psychic for many years on their Radio 2 show and elsewhere. Really entertaining guy himself. And they were speaking about how the song became part of the sitcom, became the theme. He said, quote, I knew Craig from Manchester. I didn't know Caroline. Craig had a radio show in Manchester and they just asked if they could use the track. It's funny because it was a B-side. I mean, that show made the song famous, really, because that song was never performed until way into the 2000s. It became a thing. They asked for that song in particular. I don't know why. They would have told me why, but it doesn't bear any connection to the show. They asked, and I said, yeah. And then, of course, as that song became Christmas special after Christmas special and became part of the fabric of the culture, then the song took on a life of its own. And this is a kind of, you know, as with so many songs that become theme songs, it's doctored slightly. It's edited. Like I remember getting the Master Plan CD when I was younger and mainly listening out for this song. And uh, I'd seen Talk Tonight as well on MTV Unplugged and the song The Master Plan. But this was the first one I went to because, like, oh, it's the Royal Family song. And, uh, and, and yeah, it's uh, the actual full version. So the opening credits of the series edit together the first stanza of the first verse and the second stanza of the first chorus. And then when we get to the end credits of the show, you know, it cuts straight in uh, on the second stanza of the final chorus, which just adds a real oomph and, and weight to it. And, you know, the, how many final jokes of the episode just go bang and then... So what do you say? That synergy is perfect. Apparently, after Carolina Hearn passed away as well in July 2016, uh, Noel Gallagher, his band, his solo band High Flying Birds, actually played it uh, on a few occasions to pay tribute to her. And what a song. Let's just take it as a song itself. Like Woke Up This Morning from Sopranos, where you have the shots of Tony driving to uh, from New York to New Jersey. It's just... It's ingrained, really. I cannot listen to this song and not imagine those flickering images that open the show. It just has that sense of domestic despair that is so Royal Family, you know, that kind of bittersweet hopefulness. It's a perfect melding of song and image that is really hard to hear or imagine any other way, despite how hard that John Lewis advert tried a few years back. And Noel had said that he thought what they wanted was Married with Children, which is the closing song of Definitely Maybe that I'm sure, you know, most people are aware of. Let's just listen to a little bit of that now. And can you imagine this as being the Royal Family theme song? There's no need for you to say you're sorry. Goodbye, I'm going home. I don't care no more, so don't you worry. Marvellous song, undeniably, but it has a slightly wry, sarcastic quality, an end of the peerness that uh, half the world away doesn't really possess. And as amazing as Liam's voice is, Noel, for me, was always better at connoting that kind of forlorn, adrift nature, you know, and, and some of the lyrics as well match, old town don't smell too pretty, like a, ni a nice coincidence, obviously, uh, the idea of bad smells lingers <laughs> throughout Royal Family, scratching around in the same old hole as well, just that kind of homespun, intimate feel is such a match, and this song, combined with the actual editing itself, just make the intro a classic in my eyes. And thus begins the first episode, which was originally aired on the 14th of September, 1998. It was written by Caroline Ahern, Craig Cash, and Henry Normal as well. I mean, again, the genesis of the show I will explore in a future episode. But just quickly on Henry Normal, he was someone who had worked on the uh, Mrs. Merton show and worked on a lot of shows prior to that. So um, obviously he co-wrote the first series with Caroline and Craig. He helped set up Baby Cow Productions in 1999, and he executive produced all of the shows during its 17 and a half year output. I mean, I'd listen to some of this stuff. Mighty Boosh, Uncle, Moonboy, Marion and Jeff, 
Camping, which I thought was amazing, Honda B, uh, these Julia Davis series, Alan Partridge, of course, uh, Gavin and Stacey, like this guy is just, yeah, wow, what, what, a, uh, what a legacy. And uh, apparently he performs a lot of poetry at literature festivals now and was recently given honorary degrees by both Nottingham University and Nottingham Trent University. Apparently he has a beer and a bus named after him in his home city as well, but that isn't footnoted on Wikipedia, so hopefully I can trust that. Uh, this was episode was directed as well by Mark Mylod. I hope I'm saying that correctly, who, um, again, has done crazy work. He actually was a director for Succession recently on HBO. He directed a few Game of Thrones episodes as well. The guy who directed the pilot of The Royal Family. Sorry, the guy who directed the first series of The Royal Family directed Game of Thrones as well. I just think that's wonderful. But, um, yeah, let's get into the episode itself. And for a show so obsessed with money and means it makes sense for this to be the opening line and i take quid hey, quid it's good to talk my ass we fade in with jim's quote into the packed confines of the living room with the opening shot establishing Denise carefully painting her nails beside an overflowing ashtray. I mean, and this is a great intro shot, capturing the blend of the intimate and the mundane that the royal family does so well. Straight away, we can hear the TV playing in the background. And, you know, of course we can, because the TV really is another character on the show, another member of the royal family, if you want, an omnipresent one as well. It's really just ambient dressing or background like most other programs. Sometimes we can kind of make out what's being said, as in this opening. Sometimes the volume of the show washes over the family, like in the first Christmas special when the snowman plays. And often it's engaged with directly. I mean, think of the antiques road episode, the third episode of the series that we're going to encounter soon, or um, the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire episode, Barbara's Had Enough, an episode where Jim, Denise, and Dave actively watch the TV playing along with us, and it's really credit to the show that despite that superb sequence, there's an even better plot line running through it, the idea of Barbara finally storming out, but, you know, we'll get to that later. And it's not only the construction of the living room, but the way it's actually captured on film, the, the grainy somewhat grubby but all too lifelike feel the view through this kind of Mike Lee, Ken Loach type cinema verite style you know this is kind of one of the things that maybe lets the later specials down I mean they're certainly they're different shows aren't they really like Queen of Sheba is kind of the bridge and then you get into the Christmas specials kind of the comedy the writing the feel is different not necessarily worse but you know it kind of isn't classic raw family if you will and one of the reasons for that is because it looks a little bit too much like a tv show at that point it looks like a lit set whereas here it's just so authentic you know you really do feel like a fly on the wall and i want to say as well throughout this podcast i am going to be referring to uh the complete scripts the raw family complete scripts can you hear the pages flickering there which uh, i got off ebay recently brilliant to read through and in these scripts i mean there are some quite a few differences there's like a lot of lines that you know got changed on the fly and um from what i gather from the sort of documentaries that i watch and stuff like there was a sense of collaboration i think um ricky thomason coined the term lurch for anthony and, and that got used in the show and stuff like that but um what we do have as well is a lot of exposition in the scripts that obviously isn't shown on screen so here's what it says scene one interior tea time living room dad ma'am denise mary anthony it is half past six on a February Friday evening. A 26-year-old working-class girl, Denise Royal, is sitting watching TV with her mam. Her dad, Jim Royal, in his 60s, is sitting reading a phone bill. All three smoke constantly throughout. Now, do we ever actually see Jim smoke? I don't think we do. He does ask for cigarettes in this episode and other episodes. And maybe he smokes at the pub down the feathers or something like that but you don't seem to see him ever with a fag in his mouth which um yeah uh, i'm not going to explore too many like uh, fan theories or anything like that i kind of want to keep it a bit more holistic but just something to consider anyway so we start with jim complaining about the bill and you know he says it's good to talk my ass which is our very first pop culture reference in the show and i do again just because i'm sort of of that age where i kind of remember watching tv as as a young boy and things lodge in your memory i do have a recollection of this advert which uh was bob hoskins none other than bob hoskins doing this advert for bt he of made in dagenham long good friday roger rabbit etc more often than not what men call chatter really does 
does matter. It's about being a friend. Having the time to listen. And you know what? It's what makes the world go round. While those two are in town, guess who's looking after their kids? That's right, a friend. It's good to talk. And Hoskins was actually the first in a string of major Hollywood stars that featured in the BT ads. You know, most recently we've had Ryan Reynolds and Jeremy Renner in the kind of hyperspeed BT Infinity stuff. Apparently the Goon Show's Harry Seacombe as well would host some in the 60s. So we get our first pop culture reference and we get our first my ass too. Jim's very own catchphrase, which is interesting because... The show is so iconoclastic and, you know, does smash so many stereotypes of scripted comedy and really kind of paved the way for the postmodern explosion ushered in the early 2000s by The Office and the rest soon after. But Jim has a catchphrase. And to be honest, people do have catchphrases. People do have, you know, things that their brains are hooked on and just crop up regularly in their speech patterns. And he says my ass, and I am going to be keeping a count of all the my asses in the show on each episode. Maybe it'll drive me mad. I don't know. But uh, yeah, there's the first one. And Barbara is introduced as the mediator between Jim and Denise as he continues to interrogate the bill. You know, enraged at the number that he asked for is actually Mary's, the Rawls next door neighbour who we're soon to meet. You're tight as a crab's arse, you there. Crab's arse, my arse. It's £2.50. It's a good job she secured a stutter. The phone's there to be used. The phone's there for emergencies. How many times have you seen me ringing anyone? Uh, you got no ring, you've got no mates. <laughs> Jim's humour flashes through here talking about Mary's stutter, which I imagine is a joke. And Denise ribs him back, you know, who would he ring? He has no mates. And we do meet one of Jim's friends, Twiggy, later in the episode. But he does badmouth him pretty much instantly about his weight, which is not only nasty, but hypocritical as well. So maybe she's right. What's important that's established here, though, is that Jim's no tyrant. You know, he can be impossible and unkind and spiteful but we do see a loving side of him every now and then especially with baby david and you know he plays the entertainer as well uh with the comedy with the banjo you know at times it's not hard to see why barbara fell for him and then at others you just want to grab your coat and storm off with her Mary is one of the people that Barbara's been ringing, and as if to underpin Jim's irate rage at her proximity, she comes right in, and we get our first secondary character in the fizzing form of Mary, who is just popping with uh, life and mania, played by uh, Doreen Keogh, by the way, who um, really just nails this role. I think she's fantastic here. She just has a, a pinch of madness. And R.I.P. to Doreen, by the way, who lived to the ripe old age of 93, passing away sadly on New Year's Eve 2017 in Ireland. She was in a lot of things. I mean, Royal Family was maybe her most famous role for, you know, my generation. Uh, she's in Father Ted as well. Coronation Street for 15 years. She's actually the first ever barmaid on the show, uh, playing it from 1960 to 1975. She's listed as Conceptor Hewitt, Riley and Regan. So, yeah, she got married a few times, unsurprising for a soap. Mary enters, interestingly, from the back door without a doorbell ring, unlike every other interloper in the show. And this is actually spelt out in the script here. It says, Mary knocks and enters. She is the only one who doesn't use the bell. Only me, she says, as she comes in. And ever the mother, she actually picks up a pillow and fluffs it as she sits beside Barbara. Through Mary, we learn that Cheryl lives next door. And it's very sweet that Mary, who I just love, comes round to wish Barbara the best of luck on her new career. A term which Jim immediately poo-poos, immediately leaps on. Career my ass. She's working part-time in a bakery, he says. And the two of them exchange a look of communal eye-rolling, suggesting that they've heard, you know, variations of this diatribe all before. Denise chuckles slightly, and then Mary starts to test Barbara, because obviously she's starting a new job tomorrow. Hey, I've had our Denise testing me on price this now. I've got it off by art down to pastries. Test us, Mary. Vanilla slice. 38p. I'll have two. <laughs> <laughs> I always laugh with Mary on this. There's something quite infectious about her. And she and the rest of her brood all seem to be at extremes. You know, while she is boiling over practically with glee, uh, Joe, who we won't meet for a few episodes, is essentially mute. And Cheryl, her daughter, who's coming around shortly. And I mention this not to body shame or anything, but just as kind of parallel to consider these characters. 
you know, she is also at an excess, as you were. She's, um, I mean, I mean, she's overweight. It's mentioned a lot in the show. More on that shortly, as she'll be around with the catalogue. Mary then leaves to do some ironing, and, uh, you know, watching these episodes, I'm kind of watching closer than ever before. And I never noticed, but it's really nice to kind of underscore Barbara and Mary's friendship and familiarity. Barbara playfully slaps Mary on the arse, so uh, go back and watch that in the pilot if you missed that before. I can kind of sympathise with Jim getting annoyed with Mary maybe over the years and grinding him down. Uh, in season two, in Anthony's birthday, you know, we learn that they've been neighbours since well, forever, like she says, Auntie was a child doing the birdie song to her, so clearly they've been neighbours for a long time. Denise carries on testing Barbara on the prices, and Jim then discovers Aberdeen on the bill, which I'm pretty sure is never resolved. It's our uh, our very own Russian in the woods for any Sopranos fans. You know, the world building is so graceful in this show, and there's a really nice, tasteful segue. They're talking about prices, which parlays into Denise asking if they have wedding cakes, and thus we learn about her upcoming nuptial to Dave, the wedding of course being the sort of narrative arc of this season, season two I guess is Denise's pregnancy, and I suppose baby David, and kind of the change of dynamic in the family is season three, Jim then fumes at the £200 cost of a wedding cake, and we get our first off-screen character mentioned, though technically we do meet Dave's dad in a one-off Christmas special. Is his dad paying out towards his wedding lark, or what? I told you dad, he's on a disability allowance. So he's paying bugger all, and he'll get a better pack. Space. Jim is of course a hypocrite on Gyro himself, but you know, sees no problem with sticking the knife in. After this, put upon Anthony enters and ignores Jim's questioning about Aberdeen, grabbing his egg and chips from the oven. I just love the details here. You know, his comments on the fact that it's soggy egg and chips and his own equally moist mop of gel and wearing the tracksuit. Like Jim having a catchphrase, Anthony brings to mind another sitcom trope, that classic dog's body slave, like, say, I don't know, Faulty Towers Manuel. But, you know, who hasn't been Anthony amongst parents and older siblings? And if you haven't, who hasn't ordered someone younger than them around? Because they're younger, they're, they're lower on the pecking order. Jim is relentless to Anthony here, just, you know, asking him, berating him. You know, he's barely had a chip before he has to go back and turn off the kitchen light. It's so relatable. Jim asks if uh, he thinks that he's Rockefeller. Of course, that's a reference to J.D. Rockefeller, John Davidson Rockefeller, who was an American philanthropist and business magnate, widely considered the wealthiest American of all time and the richest person in modern history. Supposedly, at his peak, he controlled 90% of all oil in the United States. They're watching TV. They're watching Birds of a Feather, and there's a wonderful shot as Anthony sits down from his vantage point. Uh, the plates underneath, the slightly pale CRT is above, you know, a real another world in direct contrast to the one that we're viewing. Anthony asks if there's something else on, and I don't blame him. You know, I remember seeing bits of this as a kid and wanting nothing more than just to turn over to BBC Two and, you know, hope The Simpsons is on. Birds of a Feather, never really a fan of this show too much, but, uh, you know, this is the Royal Ramble, so anything that comes up, we've got to do a little bit of history on it. It's a British sitcom, uh, originally broadcast on BBC One from October 1989 to uh, the final episode was apparently Christmas Eve 1998, and then it was revived on ITV for three years. It starred Pauline Quirk, Linda Robson, and Leslie Joseph. In the first episode, sisters Tracy Stubbs and Sharon are brought together when their husbands are sent to prison for armed robbery. Sharon, who lived in an Edmonton council flat, moves into Tracy's upmarket house in Essex. The next door neighbour and later friend, Dorian Green, uh, Leslie Joseph, who Jim will speak about shortly, is a middle-aged married Jewish woman who is constantly having affairs with younger men. And after Jim insults Leslie Joseph... Oh, it's that Leslie Joseph, isn't it? And they're now on the other side. She's got a mouth like a horse, that one, hasn't she? Cheer. She wants a good swipe of shot. <laughs> we get a long silence, which is classic royal family and really anathema to comedy or broadcasting in general. But again, this is something so real. You know, no one's saying anything. Everyone just existing in a kind of, um, you know, a comfortable muteness. We get to watch the characters watching characters. And as cosy as the confines of the living room can feel, this can also be, it's quite experimental, you know, at times. It's quite forward-thinking. 
and they're not really doing anything, you know, to earn that. But um, it, I, I love the fact that it will just pause and it will just allow things to happen. There's, there's no laughter track. I mean, we can kind of hear birds of a feather uh, mewing the background, but that's all. In this silence, though, Anthony has been chomping and obviously this irks Denise to no end. And we get another defining concept of the royal family. You know, the fact that the laziness is so entrenched at a certain level, certainly through Denise, but we see it through some others as well, that um, it's demarcated. You know, Denise can't just speak to Anthony. She has to go through her mother to do this. Mommy, tell Anthony to shut his gob when he's eating. Anthony, shut your gob when you're eating. The channel is switched over to a travel program, which I'm fairly sure is Wish You Were Here. You know, I know it's kind of a show that's been on for decades. It's a British TV show, first broadcast in January 74 on ITV, a series of 30-minute shows about travel and holidays. It's actually cancelled in 2003. And some eastern background music flares up on the TV, and Denise goes to see Cheryl, who has brought across the catalogue that Denise asked Mary about before. Still in the living room for a moment, Jim continues to examine the bill, asking Barbara about another character we never meet, Barbara's Auntie Vi, who lives in Middleton, and they have a little bickering back and forth here. Middleton, I mean, Middleton, one of many places in the kind of greater Manchester area. I, I love all these references to random places in the area, you know, these kind of um, places you'd only know if you were from around there. And obviously me being from Birmingham, don't know at all, but still like looking them up. Middleton, a uh, town in Rochdale, Greater Manchester, uh, you know, very close to the city centre. Population of 42,000 apparently in the 2011 census. Moonraker is a name given to people from the town. Uh, Lee Rigby, RIP to Lee Rigby. He was from Middleton. Uh, Steve Coogan attended a grammar school there. Paul Scholes grew up part of his youth there. And this is what I'm going to do, by the way, as I keep saying. I do love these brief references to real places. So any corrections or additional info, please get in touch with me, the Royal Ramble Pod at gmail.com. Okay, into the second scene, and now we find ourselves for the first time in the Royal Kitchen. Denise is sitting down, scouring the pay-by-week offerings in the catalogue. And Cheryl, who is always counting the pounds throughout the show, is counting the pounds here on the catalogue. And how amazing is Jessica Stevenson in this show, or it's uh, Jessica Hines now, isn't it? Her eyes say everything. Her physical comedy and awkwardness is spectacular. And it's mad how she's created kind of two legendary, at least in my eyes, two legendary British comedy characters in Cheryl and then Daisy from Spaced. Of course, she created Spaced and wrote Spaced as well. And one thing I noticed in this scene is that as Denise is chatting at the table, Cheryl is standing behind her, eyeing something on the side. It's not quite clear what it is. And as she goes to speak to Denise, she surreptitiously shoves it into her mouth right before she sits down. And it's worth taking into account the kitchen set for a moment as well, the design, the fridge, the plate clock, the scales, the grease caked above the oven, the mugs. You know, it feels like something out of an Arthur Miller play. Everything's ordered and freighted with meaning yet still casual and familiar it was a nice subtle joke too as they're debating what to order uh, Cheryl was saying she's having brown so Denise is going to go for black they wouldn't want to look the same Denise says I mean of course they don't look the same and maybe that's part of the friendship Anthony mentions it later in the episode you're only having her as a bridesmaid to make you look better and you can imagine it they never seen that pally really unless it's a moment we're going to get to in a second where Denise gets Cheryl to close her eyes and puts her finger straight onto some installment schlong hey Cheryl all right close your eyes what all right give us your finger <laughs> wait wait right open him <laughs> <laughs> what are you like <laughs> I wouldn't mind one of those, actually. This is a weird shape, isn't it? You know what I mean, though? Maybe it's just a different sort of type of friendship. And, you know, Denise does stick up for her uh, later on when we have um, your Twiggy's girlfriend <laughs> sort of goes at Cheryl. Great scene, great character. Shout out Sally Lindsay. But, yeah, that this kind of thing always stuck out to me, and I kind of like it. I kind of like... I love the fact that the first episode has this real kind of innocent kind of, you know, very youthful sort of interaction between them. And, you know, the blink of an eye, Cheryl's going to be going up after baby David was coring on the monitor for so long. Cheryl shows her fragility after it when she says, I wouldn't mind one of those, actually, and pulls a silly face, but she goes unheard. Her loneliness shines through in this lewd moment, and it's actually quite sad. 
I love the way the show sets up characters prior to us meeting them. You know, we hear about Mary's manic energy being in and out like a yo-yo first, and then she comes in. And our first mention of Dave. What's uh, Dave? Is he, is he wife fronts or boxers? My everywhere is always full of skiddies. Mm-hmm. My ass indeed. There's more silence and we learn it's six weeks to go to the wedding. It's not one-to-one, I think. I mean, we have six episodes with six weeks counting down, but, you know, it's a month and a half away. Denise lights a fag on the stove and tells Cheryl that uh, Sandra Bezik is doing her perm, another character that's going to crop up throughout. And it's interesting that Denise, you know, in spite of Sandy doing this for her and, you know, having now gone mobile under the guise of Sandy Scissors, she's laughed at because the name is crap. But that sense of sovereignty and ingenuity is certainly something Denise would never do. And maybe she's just trying to downplay it for that reason. Maybe that's the same reason she has Cheryl as a best pal. But, you know, again, they are neighbours. They are childhood friends. And we're a long way from Me Too. This is the roaring 90s, after all. And when the two of them discuss their weights and cellulite and getting ready for the wedding, it's a relief that Dave isn't a modern man. Got to lose two stone as well. I have. Oh, there's no on you. You tiny. Oh, you're joking, aren't you? Like a bleeding sumac. And I've got a right arse full of cellulite. Mind you, Dave likes his women with a bit of meat on him. Sexy pig. Yeah, he is. Hey, thank God. <laughs> Cheryl mentions Gary, who's Dave's best man, Gary from the Butchers. And I did consider if it's a subtle joke that Cheryl mentions Gary uh, because he stinks of mints, you know, and that's maybe part of the reason the food thing. I, I, I don't know. There's a minor continuity error I spotted too of the orange aid bottle on the corner having the label loose and then suddenly it's back on and then it's loose. Check it out. I think the label loose is more believable. Anthony enters, and you can really imagine these three of all growing up together. Cheryl says hello in a slightly embarrassed way, but Anthony just harshly adds to Denise saying something in the catalogue would look good on her, that, what is that? It must be a tent. And Denise, you know, she can be quite scary sometimes as well. You know, we hear about when she's drunk later. But she fights for Cheryl here, but you feel it's more perhaps a chance to go at Anthony than anything else. Anthony. Keep that out, keep that shut, or you'll get them blacked. Yeah, Carolyn O'Hearn's quite threatening when she does that. But of course, Denise calls to Barbara straight away, saying that Anthony's being cheeky to Cheryl. And interestingly, Denise offers to make their teas because Anthony doesn't wash his hands. But later in one of the specials, she says to her mom that she doesn't know how to make her teas. Again, I'm not trying to poke holes, you know, in in the sort of legacy or whatever. It doesn't really matter. This ain't fucking lost or anything, but it's just worth noting. Anthony ferries the teas into the living room, and just as he's about to sit down, the doorbell goes. You know, it's almost, again, something from the sitcom classic tradition here, Chaplin-esque, the overworked underling who has lugged everything in and then has to get up again. And I want to do a deep dive as well on the mugs throughout this show as they remain consistent and they're just just perfect in their design. You know, they really feel real of a sort of working class 90s Manchester family. One of the ones that doesn't feel that way, and it's always baffled me, is the Tory tea mug. We see it in this episode, we see it in most episodes. It's just a mug that says Tory tea. And the show outwardly at least i know everything's political but outwardly isn't political politics isn't really mentioned at all i don't think and you would imagine that they were labor if anything and i'm sure ricky thomason would ensure that they would be if they weren't going to be but it is manchester after all and good on them but yeah why would they have a tory tea mug is it ironic i they're not really a family hot on irony like why would they just have a mug that says tory tea does it have any other meaning? I tried to Google around this, couldn't really find anything. Again, if you guys know why they have that mug or any theories on that mug, uh, the Royal Ramble Pod at gmail.com. And from here, the doorbell, it's Dave. Dave enters. Cray Cash is Dave. He hangs by the doorway for a time, asking what's on. Quite gormless. It's only home and away, Barbara says, and we can hear a Aussie snarl emanating from the box. Home and Away, by the way, of course we did the research on that as well, is an Australian TV soap uh, created by Alan Bateman and started airing uh, 88, 17th of January 1988. It was on BBC for many, many years, but now it's on Channel 5. Around the 2000s it got scooped up there. Dave asks if Jim's alright and gets a muted, typical response. Barbara then asks her first ever, what have you had for your tea question? I mean, what a classic mom trope. Corn beef hash, she says. 
Barbara repeats this for Jim's benefit, kind of like how Denise will talk through Anthony, but this is a more loving way than lazy. Jim sarcastically palms it off, and Dave addresses him directly. You know, there's a familiarity between him. We, we learn that Dave um, had never spoken when he first joined the family. I think this is in the fourth episode after the night out, or the fifth episode. But, you know, here... Of course, he's he's engaged to the daughter. You know, they've been together for many years. We then have a straight few seconds of silence as Dave just sort of blank-eyed stares at the Aussie nothingness beaming through. And it's worth considering as well, kind of like Homer Simpson, Dave gets way stupider as the show gets on, Uh, you know, to the point where he's a flout imbecile in the later episodes. And I guess that's what they needed. You know, that's where they were taking the stories. It, it, It was less realistic. But... Just kind of, we'll, we'll go for that, the decline of Dave. I mean, mentally, he's already quite low down the pecking order. I love Dave, don't get me wrong. But we're going to get to that as we go through the show. Dave, you know, asked Jim, as said, if he's okay again. Familiar, his temperament, comfortable enough to do so. Jim checks if Dave's got a mate in Aberdeen. And Dave just kind of shrugs this off and heads into the kitchen. He comes through to see both of them with the catalogue. Uh, Denise informs him that Cheryl's been looking at men's knobs. Again, you know, it's it's very playful and, and very cute. And Gary gets brought up as well. Hey, Gary was asking after you, Cheryl. Oh, yeah. What did he say? He wanted to know if you were to go... Uh... Oh, yeah, what did you say? Told him you go like the clappers. <laughs> In his dreams. Changes his clothes less than Noddy him. Cheryl's reference there to Noddy, of course, Noddy being the fictional character created by Ian in Blyton, originally published between 49 and 63, and illustrated by Dutch artist Elko Martinus ten Harmsen van de Beek. What a name. Uh, and Noddy, still a legendary kind of kid's character there. Denise is her mother's daughter in so many ways, and certainly her father's daughter as well. And she asks what he had, what Dave had for his dinner. Corned beef hash is relayed again. And Cheryl is then, you know, in a role you feel that she's inhabited many times before, a gooseberry between Dave and Denise as they reminisce on the night before in his poxy transit. Uh, the ambience of this scene is just marvellous, though. The fact that the heater comes on and kind of burbles through. And you can hear the bubbling of the TV from the lounge as well. And the Royal Family writing, one of the things they love to do, is subtly pulling the rug out from under you for a comedic punch. I mean, consider later on in the show when Barbara is impressed that David and Denise have had spaghetti as a couple. But obviously it's oops rather than bolognese. And here Dave impresses Denise with his business cards from Nutsford. Nutsford Service Station. Uh, Nutsford as well. I mean, we went to Middleton. Let's go to Nutsford, a town in Cheshire, uh, southwest of Manchester, northwest of Macclesfield. Its population was 13,000 as of 2011. Notable people, famous people from Nutsford. Uh, Tom Walker, the singer, mostly historical figures that I've never heard of from Nutsford. Uh, Edward Peel as well. Oh, Elizabeth Gaskell, the English novelist. Okay, Edmund Sharp as well. So he mentions Nutsford and the idea of upping the price on his cards for his DJ sets, uh, you know, to make the money back in one gig. I mean, it's kind of inspired. It's a little bit harebrained. It reminds me of Jim's own advice to Dave on the wedding day, you know, of saying, you know, you'll be back at half, say, you know you're going to be back at 11, but say you'll be back at half 11 and, you know, she'll be none the wiser here. And Dave does seem smarter, as I say, less worn down, perhaps, than he will be later from the royal he's engaged to marry. Behind Dave as well, we can see, the, the again, the grease on the walls and, and the pans. And, you know, we never, it's always one sort of single shot. We never get a kind of panoramic approach to the kitchen, but I, I feel like I know it as well as my own. And Denise is insistent that she'll be on the cards. They bat back and forth here. They're in a playful mood. You know, Dave wants to do the disco. And... Denise gets off a really funny line here. Who's doing your disco at the wedding? Me. You can't do it, you're the bleeding group. All right, all right, Gary can do the first hour then, get it going. Hey, bring Gary on the honeymoon, you can do the first hour there, get me going. They're in a flirty, kind of carefree mood. And, you know, Denise can be very temperamental and a big handful, as we'll see later on. But as a couple, on the eve of nuptials, Very believable, great chemistry between the two of them here. Twiggy enters now, amazing character. And I love the description of Twiggy in the the script. Dave enters, followed by Denise and Cheryl with greetings for Twiggy. Twiggy is a large, scally bloke. And that says it all, really. I mean, you know, he's coming in with a bag load of gear. 
Barbara Evan Maternal goes straight to him and asks about his mum's legs. And he says she's still under the hospital. Tell her I was asking for her, Barbara said. Twiggy, of course, played by Jeffrey Hughes. Someone who I didn't even realise apparently provided the voice of Paul McCartney in the animated film Yellow Submarine. He was Eddie Yates in Cora. Uh, you know, kind of like uh, Mary before, but they wouldn't have crossed paths. Maybe for a year they did, actually. 74, 75. They might have had some scenes together. Who knows? Probably not. Uh, best known for being Onslow in the Keeping Up the Appearances. And, of course, Twiggy in The Royal Family. He was in Heartbeat and stuff like that. On the TV, Anthony is watching Blockbusters gets another dig in at Cheryl when she says, has he got any jeans for her? And he says, yeah, the ones you're wearing. Which again, quite nasty, quite harsh, but you know, Anthony gets digs in where he can, I suppose. Blockbusters that Anthony's watching, you know, classic British TV show as well, based on the American quiz show, the same name. Uh, loads of famous people have been on it before they were famous. Stephen Merchant was on it. Uh, John Tickle, remember him from Brainiac. Uh, Daniel Kitson, Connie Huck as well returned. And Twiggy, you know, what a charmer he is. Like Jim, he says what's on his mind without any reserve, but he couches it in a more humorous winning way rather than just being rude. Oh yeah, right. Now, how are you fixed for Jenham? Just feel the quality of that. You haven't got any wedding dresses in there, have you? No, these are jeans. It's a constant hustle for Twiggy. You know, the jeans don't really get much interest, although, you know, Jim takes a pair to try on. As he leaves the room... Twiggy basically speaks about the wash and go that he's got. He says, wash and go, the stuff that bird in the ad washes with and pisses off. Which I couldn't seem to find the actual advert for that. If anyone has that wash and go advert or knows what he's actually referring to, the specific advert, maybe you can let me know. It's a genuine stuff, but with Arabic writing on it. 50p a bottle. The pitch works on Cheryl, however. And she gets a box of panty pads added into the mix. Twiggy gets a line off on Cheryl here, you know, I'll help you out of the jeans sort of thing. And they get together later. And Cheryl references Twiggy in the uh, the final episode of this season that she's thinking of copying off him, you know, if no one else is interested. And they do get together in one of the uh, specials, but then break up again. And, you know, Barbara is just always expanding these tendrils of concern. And this is probably my favourite sequence in this episode. I mean, this dialogue is just heartbreaking as he recounts his uh, relationship with his child. How's your little Lee? Ah, oh, she lets me see him every other Saturday and every third Wednesday from uh, four till seven. Oh. He must be getting quite big now. Yeah, he's, uh, he's 12 in August. Mind you, he's a fussy little bleeder. It's got to be Nike this and Levi that. Won't touch any of this shite. <laughs> now, Shirley, you having them jeans, aren't you? Oh, no, I don't think so. Oh. What's so brilliant is the multifaceted setup of the shot. The way it's shot is we see sort of the trail of Twiggy's tracksuit off screen as he's speaking to Barbara and this kind of multi-tiered chorus in front of him. So Barbara is sympathetic. Denise next to her is uninterested. And Cheryl is just absolutely entranced by this man as he's saying this quite depressing stuff, you know, wide-eyed and beaming in infatuation. Or perhaps it's just the glee of extra panty pads, I don't know. And behind her... Dave is inspecting the dubious quality of the jeans and all of this resolving at the end to uh, he won't touch any of this shite I mean what a stinging kick that punctures the fantasy brilliantly Jim enters to laughter with the jeans on the camera pans up from his ankles Jim is keeping them he's left his money in his trousers I mean uh, Twiggy is a little upset at this it must happen so many times to him they are mates I suppose uh, Anthony's settling down by the TV sitting in front of it as I'm sure most of us did when the seats were taken by guests Denise brings proceedings though back to her mother for a moment informing Twiggy that Barbara is going to be in the bakery that he's working in and you know the royal family posits so much of the outside world and so many of the interactions. And it's nice to imagine, you know, Twiggy going into the bakers and Barbara working there and stuff like that. And we get another fantastic joke, which I love just for its absurdity. Hey, Twiggy, next time you're in the bakers, guess you'll save you. Who? Mama. Me. Is that right, Barbara? Yeah. Hey, I'm always in there. Are you? Yeah. Hey, what do you have? Yeah. Uh, two Cornish pasties, a sausage roll and a cream danish. £1.32. Am I right? 
haven't got a clue. I'll see you in there tomorrow. Because how would he know? I mean, you know, for, I mean, his order, by the way, two Cornish pasties, a sausage roll and a cream danish, that's a serious order. But you wouldn't know that off the top of your head. And for her to expect that, for her to, you know, she's expounding all this mental energy, which is so charming, trying to work out the £1.32. You know, am I right, she asks with a smile, as if he's this kind of surrogate customer. And just for him to say, haven't got a clue, like him just to disregard that straight up, I just think is terrific. And Twiggy leaves... And Jim is just straight into the insults of his way, you know, again, not seeing the hypocritical side. Which leads to Barbara asking Cheryl about how her diet's going. Um, she stuck to it for a fortnight, she says. Hasn't lost anything, though. And then basically leaves and kind of awkwardly gets by Dave here. You can hear David Attenborough as well on the TV in the background as she uh, uncomfortably departs. The insults keep coming onto the poor girl Cheryl. Bridesmaid, my arse. She looked like a bloody Easter egg on legs, Jim says, and, you know, Anthony starts to team up with Jim. I think she'll ever get married. <laughs> Who'd have her? <laughs> Stevie Wonder. <laughs> Jim changes the channel, and by proxy, we get to learn that it's Friday, because it's TFI Friday with Chris Evans. I mean, one of the great things about the Royal Family, what an awesome repository of cultural artefacts, you know, from the past. Like, again, another show that was huge in the 90s, uh, broadcast on Channel 4. It was produced by Ginger Productions, written by Danny Baker and hosted by Chris Evans for the first five series. The sixth series was hosted by a number of guest presenters. Uh, it was broadcast on Fridays at 6pm, from the 9th of February 96 to the 22nd December 2000. And, oh man, not only the guests, but all the musical acts as well they had on there. Cranberries, The Cure, Eels, Metallica, R.E.M., Manic Street Preachers, Foo Fighters... Jim's just attacking anyone in sight now, really going at Chris Evans. Denise tells him he's a millionaire, and he says, well, he's still got ginger bollocks. And that reminds Barbara <laughs> that they've got the tangerines in the kitchen. Who wants a tangerine? Denise is quite caring here, asking her mom if she's going to be worried about um, work tomorrow. And Jim, again, just digs the knife in. What the hell is there to be nervous about? There's only your mates going in by the sound of it, which is quite funny. And Dave then reveals uh, that he saw Duckers, Terry Duckers, another character we never bump into but hear a hell of a lot about, who has just got out of prison. You know, Jim can roll with the punches and jab, but here he actually just gets pissed off with Dave, where uh, Jim is asking what he was in for. You know, David's seen him in the Chinese. Dave says beef satay, half rice, half chips, which, you know, again, kind of classic line here. What was he in for, knobhead, Jim says, with some bitter ire there. And Barbara, like, you know, my mom would do the same. If ever you ever mention anything that maybe you haven't had for dinner, you know, we should have that one night. We should have beef satay one night, she says. She then finds that she's out of fags and gets Anthony to nip off to the offy, another location we never see, like the bakers, like the feathers. And this offy, by the way, is so close. It must be bloody next door to Joe and Mary's because he's back in there quick, like... I know the show's meant to be in real time, but it is interesting that he just gets back there in like a minute or two. Um, he goes for Siggy's, you know, basically gets 20 for Denise, 20 for Barbara. Jim wants them as well, which again, we never see Jim smoke. Quite interesting that he asks for those. Anthony asks if he can get any cigarettes out of the change. And, uh, you know, Barbara kind of being harsh, but, you know, morally not the greatest advice. You're only 15. I told you about smoking. You're not old enough to smoke so you can buy your own. And don't slam that door. He leaves. They talk about duckers again. Dave brings up the idea of, uh, that he's invited him to the wedding. And obviously he's joking. Denise gets pissed off. Kind of like how Jim got pissed off with the duckers joke earlier. You know, they are quite volatile emotionally. Uh, Dave then starts to butter her up. There's a nice shot of Denise and Barbara next to each other. Uh, Denise slouched in that low way that you do when you watch CD when you watch TV, and she plays the situation to her strengths, and Dave starts to massage her feet, Barbara then sort of debates her own looks, and you know, Jim, again, doesn't really have a kind word to say, but that's kind of what he is, you know, and Dave's been working all day, and Jim is questioning why Dave is kowtowing to Denise, but, you know, they're in love. And then Anthony returns from the offy in record time, as I say. Jim digs into his pork scratchings. Jim asks Dave if he's got a gig tonight down at the Feathers. And we have our first reference to the mythic, you know, certainly the most important character that we never meet in the show. And I'm pretty sure the final line of the last episode, uh, Barbara's Old Ring, makes reference to this character as well. Of course, it's Beverly Macker 
who's Tony Macca's sister, and she's 18. It's her 18th down at the Feathers. She's got two kids. She works in the co-op, we learn as well, and Denise absolutely despises her. She just, oh, she cannot stand her, can she, at all? You got a gig tonight, Dave? Yeah, I'm on down the Feathers. It's Tony Macca's sister's 18. Mm -hmm. What, Beverly Macca from the co-op? Yeah. She 18? Mm. Are her kids going? Yeah. Who's the father of them two? Don't know. Could be anyone in the feathers. It could be anyone in trousers. You fancy her? Yeah. She's the right slapper. Eh? Oh, I feel a bit sorry for her with them two kids. She's had it hard. She likes it hard. That's her trouble. It gets a little bit awkward, so there has to be something to break the ice, and it's a fart. Oh, oh Dave, have you farted? What? That's one of your old fellas, that. Hey, whoever smelt it, don't it. It's not corned beef, that. Oh, we're going to have that one night. The Royal Family is such a sophisticated show, but I can't think of any other programme that talks more about shitting and farting and having the wild shites and skid marks and all that sort of stuff. But again, that is kind of the reality of home life, you know. <laughs> Maybe not so much for you as it was for me or, or vice versa, but um, it smells like corned beef hash. So we learned that it was Dave who farted and... You know, Barbara, again, kind of like with the tangerines, she smells it, that it's corned beef hash, but doesn't kind of recoil. It's more like, oh, we're going to have that one day. And the look that Jim shoots Barbara there is absolutely fantastic. We learn as well that, you know, of course, everything revolves around Barbara. Uh, she's who's going to make the dinner tomorrow when she's not here. But, you know, they say that they'll wait for her. Don't worry about that. We get nice interactions here with the reactions to the farts as well. In Middle Eastern countries, that's a sign of respect, <laughs> Jim says. That's burping, Denise says. Same difference, different hole. The phone rings. And, of course, it's Nana, the immortal Nana, Liz Smith. You know, one of the greatest characters ever on television. Uh, you know, I can't wait till we can start discussing her more deeply as we go through. Uh, I think it'll be the third episode, the Sunday dinner episode. Yeah, the, the, the Antiques Roadshow episode where she'll actually come in. But I love the fact that she calls ahead and we sort of get a feel for her and how, you know, she's like everyone else's nan. Like, I mean, it's kind of sad for me to say now looking back, but certainly when I was a kid... You know, if my nans are on the phone, I didn't really want to talk to them. Like, it was fine in person, but there's just not much to say. And, you know, the phone dilly-dallies around here. Barbara asked what she had, and they say, oh, we had that. Dave's had corned beef hash. Um, you know, again, there's a lot of sort of knowing, winking ironies where they say they're up to their eyes in it here. They can't seem to get anything done as they're just staying stationary and stolid watching it. Jim gets thrown the phone and just kind of, you know, passes it off to the knees instantly. And they sort of talk back. We learn that Nana's 82. She took a voucher into the precinct and it was a day off. And they wouldn't let her have the money. It was 20p. And, you know, Jim kind of rightly says that it costs them more money to ring around and tell people about it than it would the actual discount. Do you want to talk to Jim? No, he's doing out. Hello, Norma. How are you doing? What? Just a minute, Denise. Oh, hang on. Our Denise can't wait to bloody talk to you. Hey, Nana. Yeah. And I love how it's one-sided, so we can't hear... Uh, what Norma's saying, but, you know, Denise says, like, well, if they're too tight, take one of the insoles out. All right, I'll give you back to mine. So it's just the idea that she's talking about her vouchers, talking about her tight shoes, and then she goes, and Anthony leaves as well, leaves to Darren's Darren, who will meet soon enough. Denise then starts to put makeup on because they're all getting ready to go for Dave's gig, or, or they are at least. She does attend every gig. And uh, again, there's a lot of sort of comparison between time encroaching and sort of how Denise looks and how Barbara looks and, you know, the schoolgirl figure. And, you know, I love how Barbara's so worried about working in the bakery and putting weight on and she wants to get herself a nice suit for the wedding. And, you know, just, again, all these details are fantastic. They leave, you know, Barbara learns from Dave just before that she's going to have a suit from Mark's and, you know, that's kind of playing with Barbara's mind to a certain extent. She's worried about that. And they're keeping up with the Joneses, as it were. And uh, Jim, kind of uninterested. Jim keeping tabs on things. Barbara's going to have a bath, ask if the immersion's on and, you know, expects her everything else is, he says. Now, I love this final shot. This final scene. So here's how it describes it in the script itself. Mam exits, leaving room empty but for Dad. Pause. Dad gets up and admires his ass, then does cowboy draw in the mirror. End of episode. 
How do you read that? Is that like the sense of escapism? Are, are the genes giving him some new outlook? Is he just kind of being king in his own household? Does it not mean anything? Is it just we've all done that in the mirror or flexed or whatever? But it just ends it on quite an open note. I really enjoy it, actually. I think, and then as I said before, it cuts into the word he has set. You go straight into that. And there you go. There's the end of the first episode. Uh, we'll be back next week well say next week i don't know how often i'm gonna do this show i would like to at least get one of these out each month maybe more i do do have a podcast do have a full-time job and it does take quite a lot of time to record and edit and make notes and put all the clips in except look at me make an excuse you don't give a fuck about that so yeah but i want to hear from you guys as well so email the show the royal ramble pod at gmail.com you can follow us on twitter as well at royal ramble pod i'll put all the links down below you know i want to know what you think of the pilot episode of the, of the podcast and of the show and you know in the next few weeks after this is released i'm going to be recording the second episode as well and it'd be great to read some emails out of your thoughts on the second one anything on ideas from the characters the performances the scripts maybe even your, your own history with the show when you've discovered it if you remember watching it in real time perhaps you've you know met one of the actors or have some history or some connection in some way to the royal family i would love to hear it so uh yeah this has been tom Still very much early days for the show in terms of the structure, in terms of, you know, what I want it to be like and, you know, my, my, my plans for it in the future. But this has been fun, on this end at least. Tell a fellow Raw Family fan about this. If you would be so kind, leave us a review on iTunes as well. A five-star review goes a long way, pushed above the algorithms. And, uh, yeah, guys, keep watching the show, keep listening, and I'll see you soon. Mm-hmm.